Hello, my name's Leslie Atherton, and this is my short story, a zombie story, called Underland. Fourteen men running, scared, out of breath and panicked. The entrance was close by. It had to be. They needed to find it urgently. Their supplies were heavy and slowed them down, but they couldn't dump them. The supplies were the whole point, the whole reason for them venturing out. They couldn't just be dumped. Time was running out. Shit, it was too late. Hundreds of ballroom dwellers depended upon them and they were about to fail. This was the worst thing that could have happened. It would be disastrous, not just for those men, those 14 who had journeyed out this time, but for the others too, the hundreds of others. It had been over one week since their last successful search for supplies and everything was running low. Insulin, blood pressure medication and vitamin tablets were desperately needed, as were food and water and much more. So many of the ballroom dwellers had pre-existing health conditions. They needed anti-rejection medication, nose drops, ear syringes and antibiotics. And their 25 months of troglodyte living had taken an inevitable toll on them all. Many who hadn't been up on the top were ill from the lack of air and sunlight and asthmatic from the damp, cold and fungal infestations. At first they'd tried to keep clean, to keep healthy, to eat well and keep positive but there were few now who didn't believe implicitly that the time for hiding had reached its end. The time for dying was next. These underground towns and villages were a complex mass of multi-level rooms. This ballroom had been one of the pre-built locations, having been created as an underground part of a Victorian railway station. It retained the original tiles and light fittings, and at times you could almost hear the sound of century-old music playing. Other shelters had been recently dug out, spadeful by painful spadeful. This life was awful. Not worth living. Everyone was cold, scared, always hungry, unwell and always waiting for the next scare and death or worse. Because, of course, these underland zones existed only as a place of temporary protection now. Overland, in the old world, that was where the zombies were. Zombies, how that word had at first irritated and annoyed humanity. Zombies were a relic from voodoo, they were clichés, they were nothing more than a cinematic tool. They were also real. The names stuck, though they weren't entirely like their namesakes from the movies. These masters were speedy for a start. They deal with any stragglers from the weekly reconnaissance missions without effort, being supernaturally fast and strong despite their accompanying emaciation. They weren't shrewd, though, and they weren't clever. The few entrances to the Underland were well hidden and had proven, so far, to be inaccessible to those inflexible undead. So far. The fourteen were lost. Their entrance was blocked. It was only a small landfall, but it was large enough to disorient them momentarily. And every second of disorientation meant the zombies didn't just find them, but could potentially find the entrances too. Then Frank shouted, Here! The zombies, hearing as well as, if not better than their underland counterparts, turned and ran. Frank, Donald, Eddie and Beryl were all gone. Within a few moments, the four had sacrificed themselves for the other ten and for the hundreds in the ballroom. Perhaps a noble gesture and perhaps conceding exhausted defeat. It didn't matter now. The ten survivors, not looking back as they allowed the zombies to feast on their friends, grabbed the supplies as well they could and shuffled into the concealed entrance, then down, down, down into the ballroom. Are we sealed up? Yeah. We lost four this time. It could have been worse. The zombies get closer each and every time. We'll have to dig new entrances before we scavenge again. They were safe-ish as family and friends gathered round to loot their precious cargo. Just in time, said one woman. Her father was desperate for the heart medicine. Thank God. She squeezed the shoulder of one returner. It was a thank you and a commiseration too. To comment upon lost comrades was almost unheard of. Now they were 25 months into the conflict, confusion and apocalypse. Surely they felt and noticed the losses, but each underlander was a dead soul in a living body. They weren't so different from the zombies and that particular irony wasn't lost on them. Still, the ballroom territory had established itself as one of the successful underland zones. Many others had been tried and had failed. 
the tunnels underneath churches had seemed an obvious choice at first. Back when so much was unknown about these enemies of humanity, they'd decided that crypt dwelling might in fact be the ultimate zombie defence. But no, the zombies, attracted both to the living and to the long dead, worked it out. How? Telepathic contact? If that was the case, then these creatures, these mutant humans, weren't brain dead. They weren't unthinking automatons, satisfying only their hunger for flesh. Something else was going on. But from the point of view of the ballroom underlanders, it was a form of gang warfare. Warfare for warfarin. An insulin, antibiotics, tins, packets and dried goods. Warfare on behalf of the hundreds of half-lifes that now were permanently stuck in the ballroom. The black and white tiles of its intricately designed floors weren't created for this kind of traffic. Intended for the soft dancing shoes of a previous and more privileged generation, the shoddily cobbled together footwear worn by most of the underlanders now was too rough to protect the tiles. Most were scratched and many were broken. It wasn't hard to see in those cracked ballroom tiles the loss of humanity and civilization under the chilling dawn of the worst kind of predator, one that kills for the love of it, with the eating of human flesh, merely an afterthought. Tiled and chandeliered, both ballrooms had been magnificent spaces in their heyday, but that sparkling beauty was unseen now, even by those who spent their entire existence there. The main ballroom was completely filled with huddled individuals, packed in, sitting, lying, shuffling and still. The hall next door was also full. This smaller secondary room had perhaps once been used as a bar or rest area and was now visible through long, thin window cavities. The original glass had long since gone and been replaced by a triple glazed unit of practically bulletproof strength. That was more than five years ago, they'd been told. It was almost as if the zombies had been foreseen, as if somebody knew and was trying to prepare. Perhaps that somebody also knew how they had come into unbeing and even how to get rid of them. But if they did, they were keeping very, very quiet. Most likely was the probability that the careful glazier had met the same fate as Frank, Donald, Eddie and Beryl. Millions already had. The reconnaissance party wouldn't go back up overland again for a little while. This had been an unspoken agreement many months ago. Once things were known, once supply chains were recognised and once danger was acknowledged, realistically and without self-pity, it was agreed that overland missions were to be kept to the minimum, the total and utter minimum. Other than weekly missions to the surface for supplies, these humans, pale and scared but surviving, if you could call it that, you couldn't call it living, remained in the ballroom and associated rooms, free of weather and real light. They had done for many, many months. They had no choice. Every mission overland resulted in the loss of at least a third of the reconnaissance crew. These zombies were progressive and were learning, they were fast and used the few brains they possessed. They even passed their thoughts to others. For the humans, it was unthinkable and cruel too, because not a single human communications channel still existed. No internet, no radio or television and no print media either. Humans were even forgetting how to communicate using their own voices and the written word. Where would they find paper? What did they have to write about? Why use one's energy in speech? And without communication and the spreading of information and knowledge, humanity would inevitably lose this battle. They also had no hope of answering the biggest questions. How had the zombies come to be? That was the question everyone needed answering. Who made them and why? Back in the early days, humanity had managed, for a little while anyway, to hold itself together and even managed to keep power stations running and to produce radio, television and internet reporting, just some of the valued elements of their oh-so-precious civilization, But, bit by bit, they'd been invaded and these facilities had petered out or been maliciously destroyed by the zombies. Each human understood the consequences. No communication plus no human coherence equals no future. Time is running out. Homemade underground networks had been doomed to failure. Sure, one bright spark with cobbled together scavenged items might be able to throw together some communication system that worked, but the reality of getting it to work over land while in constant fear of zombie attack 
had halted progress. In the early times, when communications were working and when police and armed forces thought they could contain the problem, they'd pontificate about it all. Why zombies? Why these overdeveloped, mutated zombies? And why now? Viral weapons were blamed. So was the genetic modification of the vampire bat and the expounded idea of the zombie being the natural evolution of the human species, which had been helped on its way following a radioactive leak. All were comic book ideas, but they were the best that these remaining humans had got. So much ignorant supposition, combined with so much fear, had led to inevitable inaccuracies. At first, humanity spoke of these, disputed and discussed them and worked on solutions. But where was the science now? Where was knowledge? The wise and good were dead. Or were hiding under land, as scared and ineffectual as everyone else. So, with the absence of scientific thought and experimentation, the outlandish suggestions took on as much weight as the most logical ones might. One fact was definitely known. These zombies, many of whom were unrecognisable as the humans whose body had housed them, owing to changed and leaner muscle mass and cranial adaptations, hadn't been bitten. Hence the talk of a virus. Many suggestions were made, including theories that the virus came from unwitting access to a zombie's body fluids or from transfer through the skin cells. Basically, and this was the scariest hell part, anyone at any time could become a zombie. Anyone could be about to change. We have all touched places where zombies touch and have all come into some contact with their fluids. To survive as a species... Humanity had to discover why some people had become super zombies and others had remained alive and human despite their equal exposure to risk. At first, the Underlanders isolated each and every reconnaissance agent who'd been overland for supplies. They'd be quarantined together for a whole day, but soon the pointlessness of that process was realised. You see, there wasn't a time span as far as anyone could work out. The zombification could happen any time and anywhere, and whether a person had been overland or not seemed to make no difference. Permanent underlanders were at as much risk as those who went overland. The people stayed in communities such as the ballroom in order to minimise attacks, not to remove vulnerability to the change. All were at risk and all were watched carefully. It made for a paranoid, difficult life. When scientists could still protect themselves in labs, Fevered attempts were made to create a blood test and to optimistically perhaps even work towards a cure. But it was impossible, as many turned without any zombie access and without any warning signs. All control options had disadvantages and impossibilities. Gas, chemical warfare, mass shootings, even if the equipment were available, wouldn't solve the incredible speed of the turnings. At first, the ballroom underlanders held strategy meetings with their constantly growing population of rescued, scared citizens. After only a few months, these were stopped. The pointlessness simply reduced morale even more. There had been attempts to usher the zombies into a large building. It had worked, so the ballroom dwellers had heard. The zombies were trapped, but were impervious to fire. So water had been tested, both as a method of drowning the zombies doomed to failure they swim, and to test the fluids for signs of some incredible mutating disease. Nothing. It was beyond doubt, incontrovertible. Humans were on their way out. The zombies had won. They were now the planet's primary species. Humanity would never live in the overland again. Humanity was losing motivation and giving up. Correction, humanity had already given up pretty much. Suicides were increasingly and frighteningly common, as was the most incredible rise in mental illnesses, stress, paranoia, neuroticism and personality disorders, if there had been anybody there to diagnose them. Remaining humans in mourning for unthinkable losses and dealing with unthinkable memories were quite understandably tired of fighting and fear and tired of this constant darkness, hunger and desperation. Living a half-life, many thought, was not preferable to death. The very opposite was the case. Let the zombies have their planet. We've done enough, had enough, seen enough. Ballroom residents were already refusing their medication. The few doctors and surgeons living under land had at first tried their best. 
but attitudes to life were changing. Suicide was still considered wrong and seen as cowardly and ignoble. But allowing oneself to die by issuing food and drugs required elsewhere was courageous, unselfish and logical, and a sacrifice of sorts. Time was running out. Let the zombies have their planet, they thought. We've done enough, had enough, seen enough. It was time to bow to greater force and give up human status as primary species. Time was running out. Let the zombies have their planet. Enough is enough. <laughs>